Hey, Nick here. That last video didn't get 40 likes. That was probably a little bit too ambitious of a goal for my small channel, but I still want to talk about this subject since I've honestly given it a lot of thought. So, here's a little bit of background. I went on Twitter. She's pretty dumb. She's dumb. <laughs> dumb as fuck. Like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, bro. I know, that was my first mistake. What was I expecting? Trying to get, like, a good conversation going for Twitter, right? But I said that I thought Lynn was a better biracial lord than Claude. <laughs> and let me tell you what happened. Kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself, kill yourself. I'm not even saying that Lynn is peak or perfect, but what she brings to the table as an outsider, a person stuck between two halves of their identity, is better executed and more narratively cohesive than what Three Houses failed to do with Claude. Really? What I plan to talk about here is why Claude is so much less captivating than his three houses peers, and how the game's diarrhea tier world building shits all over his very concept. And finally, how Lynn, a female protagonist from a GPA game from 2003, is better written than him. This is the one we've been waiting for! The ultimate battle for supremacy has begun! Let's define what Claude and Lynn have in common to even justify this comparison. They are biracial characters, Lynn being half Sakaian and Lysian, while Claude is half all Myron and half Fotish, as I'll call it, because the game does not tell us what to call it. They are raised predominantly in the culture that will be considered a racial minority in the context of the game setting. In other words, they are considered outsiders and not having a place of belonging and acceptance within the context of the main location of the game. This theme could be broadened beyond ethnicity and could easily apply to numerous factors that could make someone a part of an outgroup. Examples could be upbringing, religious identity, disabilities, disorders, or even something as trivial as hobbies. So that the scope of this video will be a little bit more broad, I will now refer to Lynn and Claude as being outsiders, but the factor that makes them a part of an outgroup is their racial identity. Now let's consider what makes a good outsider. Appearance. I don't think I'm gonna say what you're expecting here, but maybe some of you smart people, maybe you're expecting this. Claude is not a better character because he has darker skin. This doesn't make any sense since genetics don't work that way. You can present a certain way and not be a thing at all. Skin color is not a parameter for how ethnic someone is, and you can have good minority characters that are any color. It would change their lived experience, but it's all up to execution. The skin tone does not directly impact how good the character is. Additionally, Lynn is not a better character just because she wears the can guard. This would be ignoring tons of nuance of the different types of outsider characters you can have. You're only a good outsider character if you proudly show what makes you different. Stick it to the oppressors. For instance, Claude does not dress in Almyra garb during White Clouds because he is trying to hide his racial identity. So it would actually kind of ruin his character more if he dressed in non fotish garbs. But let's stick a pin in that. Essentially, appearing like you are a member of an outgroup does not necessarily mean you are a better character. The appearance that is appropriate for this character depends largely on the context and the tone taken of the character. More on tone later. Racism and intolerance. This may be surprising, but the member of the outgroup should have to deal with some kind of discrimination, discriminatory ideas, or struggles adjusting to a new social setting. On screen. I'll bet he used some dirty tricks to gain his favor. That's how those scoundrels from Dusker operate. They are not really a part of an outgroup if their identity is 100% accepted. For the purposes of this video, a character that would be a racial minority in the context of our society effectively would not be one in their society if they did not face some kind of intolerance from members of the predominant in-group. It is acceptable for this fictional character to be categorized as a minority since they still bear some resemblance to real world ethnicities, but a distinction must be made that their experience are not that of an outsider, and thus would not be relevant to the scope of this video. This does not necessarily mean that a member of an outgroup must be faced with direct discrimination, since again, it depends on the context. Flawed, for instance, it would not make any sense for him to face direct discrimination since he is once again hiding his identity. However, 
it should be made clear to the audience through recognizable and consistent patterns in the setting that this character is a part of an outgroup. This can manifest through people treating members of their outgroup with contempt. You're always so focused on the task at hand. Sometimes I almost forget you're all Myron. I always thought they were a rough and unreliable sort of people. Or showing direct dis results of this discrimination, <laughs> such as biased institutional practices. Show don't tell folks. How can I believe the character faces discriminatory attitudes and really feel for them, you know, if you don't show it to me? Tone. This point is rather nuanced because, well, this is a device that can make or break a character and completely change how the audience interprets them. Tone is how you know what an author thinks about a subject just from how it's portrayed. This crucial literary device can be developed through even types of words and sounds used to describe a character's actions or ideas. The aspect of tone I'm concerned with is, is tone by dialogue. As an example, let's take into account Sylvain and Lorenz from Three Houses. Sylvain's toxic attitudes towards women are justified by the game's tone. I cannot tell the writer saw any issue with Sylvain having these misogynistic attitudes towards women since no one calls him out on his misogyny. The women who just want to use me to become nobility? Hatred's probably the right word. Though, in the end, that's just an easy answer. I don't even know how I truly feel about it all. Just as promiscuity, which in 2023, that shit should not matter. Who fucking cares? His promiscuity is mentioned in all the support. Is it safe to assume you've been wildly carousing with women? But you just flit from one woman to the next without settling on anyone. I bet you but his toxicity towards women is not really touched on because, well, he's a victim of the system. This aspect of Sylvain is mentioned in these supports. That's the important part of his character, according to the author, since this is what they chose to focus on. <coughs> Something appears to be wrong with my throat. Lorenz, on the other hand, you can tell the author really wanted to get across an idea that social hierarchies based on lineage and status are repulsive. Lorenz has a dating preference for high status women because he feels like it would be better for his house. However, whenever Lorenz asserts his idea, he ends up changing his mind on it by the end of the support chain, and many female characters berate him about his preferences. Precisely. Status should be no impediment to love. You can tell the game doesn't hold Lorenz's ideas in high regard just from how it's represented in his dialogue and the level of pushback he receives without having any good counter-argument himself. This is a brief preview of how to read tone from an author. Now let's struggle back, let's jerk back, to how tone can apply to our specific topic of interest and how it can dramatically change the audience perception of a character. Let's consider a character so part of an outgroup. They don't really speak up for their outgroup and hide the fact they belong to this outgroup. In fact, let's propose the character as blatantly discriminatory to the people in the same group as them. Doesn't this character sound like the most infuriating piece of shit you ever heard of? Well, that can all change if the tone of the character involves interactions, dialogue, and situations that emphasize and describe the character's ideas as harmful and self-destructive. This character is being used by the author to comment on and explore themes of self-hatred. Suddenly, Mac the character is peak. Basically, I think a character that would be considered an outgroup should have some attitudes and opinions about their identity that should be shown in detail so the audience can infer some level of authorial intent. Wow, 10 minutes on the preamble. We got the watch hours up, boys. <laughs> Now let's get into the plot analysis. Let's get into why Claude is the least popular house leader and falls flat for many people. Listen, it's okay to like Claude. I like Claude, but his writing is super duper flawed. <laughs> and it starts with the base of his character. The base of his character is that he feels like an outsider, not accepted in either Fodlin or Almira due to his mixed race heritage. Thing is, after he ran away, he still found himself in the very same position. People in the outside world hated him for where he came from. This is told to us, but never really shown. We never see Claude face discrimination against the Almirans. He just tells us this has happened, 
and he's felt alienated as a result. This is mixed messaging since nobody knows the plot's heritage, so when would Fodish people have been unfair and unkind to him due to his background? And additionally, the game is so shit that we only get three Almiran characters in universe, and none of them creep claw like crap because it's heritage. No one fucking cares. It's just like, what? <laughs> Why did I get the accent? <laughs> Holy shit. So, someone told me, actually, someone told me what accent that was. I don't even know what accent was. <laughs> okay. Why did we not go to Almira once? Just once, so we can properly understand the worldview of the protagonist in your first console game since Radiant Dawn. What is the author thinking with this awful presentation? What are they trying to say by presenting Claude's experiences in this awful way? How is the audience supposed to really understand Claude with this bullshit bitch make hair world building? I can do an entirely separate video on how awful Three Houses world building is and how nothing, and I mean nothing in Fulton makes any goddamn sense, but I won't because it's off topic. But if this video does well, I will make a part two on it. We do see how Myron's face racism sparsely in the game, so I'm not saying they don't face any racism. The most notable examples are the general insistence that they are violent. Everyone says they're a bunch of brutes. Some dialogues in the monastery. That boy who assists the Archbishop. Cyril, I believe? I hear he's originally from a foreign land to the east called Almira. I know he's still only a child, but I do wonder about his true intentions. There's some people in the church who hate people like me who are from Almira, but Tomas was always real kind. And finally, the elephant in the room, the Hilda and Cyril support chain. Conduct is worthy of respect. Character is what really matters, not the place of one's birth. <laughs> this support chain is dog shit for a couple reasons. Besides the fact that it is cringe as all get out, Hilda's prejudices go unaddressed. Learning that people exist who defy your stereotypes does not really solve the underlying issue of racism and bias. This tone is pretty dismissive of Hilda's racism towards Almira since it's both never brought up again, and the characters are joyful as if everything is better because Big Brother Holst told her that Cyril is one of the good ones. I mean, look at how Cyril reacts to this situation. Why is he happy about this? That letter makes me happy. A lot of people look down on me just because I'm Almira. I love you, black man. 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 I love you. That's not what they meant when they said Black Lives Matter. <laughs> there are also some other examples. This is the Paralog dialogue and oh boy, this makes mid houses look real bad. In the Hilda and Sarah Paralog, yes, they get a Paralog together. Fantastic. Cyril says this. I'm trying to cross Fodlan's throat. I'm not saying they're not serious, but fights like this one aren't really invasions. They just start fights like this sometimes. It's so they can show off how strong they are. This is a dumb, <laughs> yo, y'all, the fact that you think you saying something is crazy. Byleth gives Ciro no pushback on this idea that all Myrans are aggressive for aggressiveness sake. So even though Ciro was a child and could not possibly know if there is some kind of political reason, the game accepts this has the blank truth. According to the game, Ciro is correct, since there is no other reason or explanation given for Almiron aggression against Bolin, and there's no attempt to paint the situation with any, with even like a shred of nuance. Bolin is always portrayed as a victim in this dynamic, evidenced by... Such negligence. What makes you so certain the Almirons will not attack us tomorrow? Sure. Then he got all worked up and started saying things like, I am the protector of Fodlin. He's protecting them from attacks. From the invaders, who are the Almirons. This rhetoric can be found in other places in the game, like the Edelgard Paralog, which still conveniently misses the perspective of these people we are supposed to be sympathizing with. Additionally, Bile has the officer hey, yep. referred to the Almirons, has irritating neighbors, and gets no pushback from Edelgard for this remark. Almost like she believes it as well. Hmm. The Almirans are portrayed as irritating, senseless invaders with no representation in the narrative to show their perspective. OBJECTION! 
yeah, 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 no, I was thinking, but no, Flaw is not giving anyone any perspective into the motives of the Almirans. He's too busy irony posting in his Hilda support to actually give us any insight into why the Almirans behave in the ways they do. So yes, the Almirans come off as aggressive and dangerous foreigners who are feared across Fultland, and for good reason. They literally attack for no reason, giving Fultish people justification for their blatant prejudice and fear. So I beg you, what is the authorial intent here? What is the tone? What does the author want us to think about Claude's ideas when racism against Almirans is sparse, and when we do get it, it's ignored and even endorsed by the writers? What are we supposed to think when Almirans are portrayed like fucking warmongering lunatics whose perspective is not once acknowledged? This game's world building is so pointless, and the only thing it builds is my desire to punch a hole through my monitor. <laughs> It only works to muddle the authorial intent and bastardize Claude's ideology. But don't get me wrong, Claude's to blame for a little bit of what goes on here. Claude also adds to the muddle tone since there is dissonance between his ideals and his response to prejudice. If Claude feels so alienated by the racial attitude towards Almirans, why does he not show any sign of discontent when his best friend Hilda, whose family is said to have owned slaves, and is publicly aggressive towards Cyril, why does he not say anything? He does not show any discontent when Hilda is Hilda, you know? Yes, I know it's in Claude's personality to mask how he's feeling, but that is no excuse for the audience to not be clued in into what's going on in his scatterbrained little head. You could show what he's thinking, not even through words. You could show it through clever camera work, and shot composition, and conjunction with the fitting soundtrack. Words do not need to be said. Claude does not even need to be confrontational with Hilda. I repeat, Claude does not need to be confrontational with Hilda. But not knowing what Claude thinks about these encounters makes his words in the war face of Golden Deer ring quite hollow. The one time Claude actually interacts with divisions between the Almirans and the Fodish is in the Shamir and Aloise paralogue. Basically, pirates are masquerading as the Almire navy in order to intimidate the locals. Claude admonishes these men as cowards and weaklings to create divisions between Fulton and Elmira. This is the only thing I could really find, and it's rather good if I'm being honest. I wish there were more moments like this that had to do with Claude being confronted with the events and ideas that counter and reinforce his own beliefs. This would provide enough development so his ideology is supported by in-game evidence and thus can be understood by the players without need of headcanon and projection. Now, Let's get back to Claude's appearance. So we're taking the pin out, we're going back to this part. Claude's design changes in the time skip create a disconnect between the gameplay and the narrative, making the presentation of Claude's character come off as sloppy and half-baked. Even though Claude is still high his identity, his promotions get design elements from Almiron fashion. This change is not accompanied by Claude being more open about his identity, he is still only open about this with Violet. And it makes you wonder if the whole cast brains have been fucked by the chronic use of Marianne's weed. Hold up. How does no one notice that Claude runs around in fabrics from the country that is their mortal enemy? What the fuck? To be clear, I love the idea as Claude promotes showing that he's growing to trust his allies and be more open with them. But this is not a part of the story at all even though the promotions are automatically acquired through progression of the campaign. I really think Shinatsu rocked it with these designs for both his promotions, but the writers did not use this to their advantage to make what it just would have been the best promotions in the series, narratively speaking. They completely ignored the significance the designs have for Claude and treated it like the other lords, because no thought went into Golden Deer route, as we all know. Claude lags behind Dimitri and Edelgar for this reason. No thought or effort was put into developing his story and ideas. Dimitri and Edelgar are not written to be outsiders, so some of the ideas I have to find may not apply. However, the tenets of Tone and Show Don't Tell can certainly apply to any character in order to determine the quality of their writing. Let's quickly glance over them. Dimitri's attitude towards the tragedy of Dusker are deeply explored. He does not just confess in the word phase how he felt about his childhood without any proper buildup. It is shown throughout a variety of his supports and throughout interactions in the Blue Line story mode. 
Edelgard's ideology is put to the forefront of many various characters such as Mercedes, Sylvain, Lorenz, and Leticia, so that the audience has a proper understanding of the tone the game takes with the issue of class and crest. This tone will then help the audience make an informed attitude about Edelgard and her ambitions. It's just easier to get behind something you understand completely. I understand what they're going for, but it's simply counterproductive to making a good and interesting character. You know next to nothing about him and his attitudes about Fulton throughout the entire game. You learn peaceful information like animism, being the Almiron custom, and there not being many trees there. But how does this really help us learn about Claude's center ideology about bridging the gap between both sides of his identity? How does it demonstrate this gap that Claude sees between himself and others? It doesn't. I honestly find it quite sad because I feel like Claude had the potential to relate to a lot of people who aren't able to fit in for one reason or another. Especially given many of his awkward mannerisms and his shallow attempts to seem charismatic. I'd let you grasp me any day. My hand, my heart, even my neck. But if you want to know all of my secrets, alas, to be surrounded by women as lovely as flowers only to be pricked by their thorns. No! No! Release me! I gotta add this to my current compilation! If you're enjoying the video so far, smash that like button and join the congregation, or else I will continue to gas up Lindis just to spite you. Speaking of Lindis, let's get into an example that gets it right. First, I will address how Lynn and Claude are not really trying to achieve the same thing, even though they're both outsiders. Claude's character is about bridging the gap between Almira and Fulton, thus unifying them so that there is no more inside and outside. This message is that if you are different, you should force a place for yourself to belong in the world. Unfathomably base? Lynn, on the other hand, does not have any big ambitions like this. The point of Lynn's character is about the struggle to compromise one's identity and values against the values of the in-group. This dilemma comes from both wanting to be accepted by the Lysians while also resisting change to the free spirits it can, she is at her core. Lynn is meant to demonstrate that outsiders should not lose themselves trying to fit in with people that would never accept them. These messages seem like polar opposites, however, she and Claude are still similar enough to compare because again, I'm comparing how well the work is outsiders. <laughs> so that's all that's relevant here. It doesn't matter what Lynn was trying to do in her story and what Claude's trying to do in his story. It just matters like how they struggle with their identity. They both struggle with identity. That's the point of their characters. Let's get into let's get into the Lynn analysis. Let's talk about Lynn. Lynn is faced with the discrimination of Sakans a few times in the story. Most notably, she has a racist encounter with Marques Arifin, who describes her as tainted and an nomadic mongrel. Lynn attests proudly that she will not seek aid from one who disparages her heritage and leaves the Marques' castle. Saint's rather upset about Arifin's remarks, while Wrath abandons his post and joins Lynn after hearing his people mocked. The tone is set very clear this behavior is vile due to how the situation is portrayed. Not only is this exchange only from the party's perspective, but also multiple characters have adverse reactions to his comments. It is not trying to show Arifin as having a point or that he is ignorant. <laughs> I, I don't even know how I'll say that. The tone admonishes the behavior for what it is. Lundgren also spouts similar nonsense, referring to Lynn as a savage from Sakai and a mongrel. Lundgren is portrayed as a two-dimensional villain with no good qualities, so him having a racist ideology effectively rebukes those sentiments. The game has sent a precedent for Alicia treating Sakaians as an outgroup, and that this perspective of theirs is reprehensible. That is much more than what Three Houses did for Almirans. And I'm not saying you can't have characters like Hilda who are a good person, but show ignorance and racist ideology. I mean, we have the Farina support with Carla, which is a fine addition to the game because it reinforces the stereotypes about Sakaeans being inferior and sets a small precedent that casual racism against Sakaeans exists within the army. What makes Hilda's bad is the cringy tone that all is good, while Farina's support does not have any of these implications. The point of this interaction is to make Farina sound fucking stupid, like she always sounds. This girl is thick, and I ain't talking about her ass. The stark contrast between genuinely thinking Sakans go ooga booga and her telling 
Carla that she's ignorant and doesn't know how the world works really gives away the ironic intent from the writers. So yeah, FE7 does a better job in Three Houses at showing the racism and intolerance that Lynn has to face in Alicia, as well as sticking to a strict tone as it pertains to discrimination. Lynn's story as an outsider in Licia is very compelling because we learn so much about her thoughts and feelings. Lynn is very open in her support conversations like with Ellie Wood and Florina about how she struggles to fit in with Licia due to the difference in their lifestyles. She asks Ellie Wood to teach her how to be a lady so that she can support her grandfather while Florina sees that she cannot stand her lifestyle in Kaylin. We know Lynn's feelings about her dilemma and how her allies support her to be her true self and be where she feels more free and accepted. Lynn's arc actually concludes, unlike a certain archer. When she advocates Caitlyn to Ostia and return to the plains and all her endings besides the bad ones, the game is telling firmly that people who are outsiders like Lynn should be true to themselves and be where, they, where it's most natural to them. I would have liked if we saw more of Lynn struggling to be there for her grandfather after the game ends, since Lynn really values family, has seen in her will and wall supports, so weighing that versus what is best for her family would have been an interesting dynamic to explore the story. Like I said, Lynn is not perfect, like I've been alluding to with the Elwood Hector thing, and as we all know, she was totally abandoned by the plot in the last third of the game. But I think this is still overall better executed than the rush mess that is Three Houses' Golden Deer route and its protagonist, Claude. Really, if, if we're being 100% honest, this is, if we're just being real, Claude and Lynn are not that different. They're both the most shafted lord that favors bows. Coming from a game with three Two lords, niggas kissing. Lynn and Claude both have similar backgrounds and they appear in the later half of the game even though they don't have much personal connection to plot in comparison to the other two lords. People insist that Lynn is more shafted, but I disagree. After all, at least Lynn got 10 chapters and good support that all add something besides her Hecker support, which is genuinely pretty mediocre. Busty. Claude gets zero chapters since his plot is borrowed from Silver Snow and only a few of his supports add anything to the purpose of his characters, such as the Violet, Marianne, and Cyril supports. The representation of the struggles of the King and people within Lindsay are very prominent within Lynn's story mode, and the author makes it abundantly clear that they find this mentality repugnant through characters like Erifin and Lundgren, and idiotic through characters like Farina. Lynn has to struggle against this system, and we all know how she feels about her situation, through a few of her supports and most of her endings. She is a great outsider because we get to see so much perspective into her struggles with the end group. Claude, on the other hand, is a victim of rushed game development. The game cannot be bothered enough to world build and demonstrate the oppression that Claude claims he faces or be consistent with what it has established. This story does not give insight into Claude's thoughts because they would rather him be mysterious. Mysterious being code for undeveloped because we need this game out now or else our stocks will go down. Instead of pretending like Claude was peak writing, it would be more productive if we let it be known why he does not work so that next time we get a lord of Starskins can claim, <laughs> lol, they aren't absolutely cucks relative to the rest of their peers. And you know, let's just complain about three houses more in general so that we don't get another mid houses. Subscribe, man! Well, that was my Claude diatribe. Insert my obligatory it's okay to like Claude statement here. I would love to get a conversation going about how Claude could have been written better, what were your issues with him, what were your feelings about him, you love him, you hate him, anything you want about Claude and Three Houses. But, that's it for today. If you enjoyed the video, smash that like button, join the congregation, or else... Blood will rain.